first time I came here, uh, I went uh, driving with a colleague and we already almost had an accident. There was a car crossing like crazy. It's almost like Italy. I fear that I'm going to be end my life really sadly by kind of an Icelander licking an ice cream driving or something, you know, they're just going to smash into me or, or something. You've come from a population where everybody rode into town on a horse like and hitched it to the rail and went and did their shopping. And so now you do exactly the same thing with cars. You know, so nobody takes any notice of parking meters, nobody parks in the car park, you just abandon it on the side of the road. But the hilarious thing is definitely if you get two cars coming in opposite directions and they, they know each other, then they stop and chat. If you did that in the middle of London, like, people would go mad. You'd get road rage. And I don't really find Icelandic people polite. Yeah, no pleases or thank yous out there. Yeah. It was the kind of, yeah, yeah. something that you notice pretty quickly. No one bothers it. We don't say please and thank you. you know, but they can, you know. That doesn't mean they accuse us of saying please and thank you for everything. Just shut up with your please and thank yous. The clearing of the, the nasal passages I find the most grotesque manner in the planet. I don't know, maybe it's like kind of urinating in public or something, but it's disgusting. Especially if you're in a dinner or you're talking to someone, having a glass of wine and they go <laughs> like that. I mean... You know, that is much better. <laughs> Hal Nolaks, as he used to say, you need first of all to put a deep root down into your native soil, and then you can range the rest of the world freely. And I think that Icelanders are both. Um, soil attached in a very local and special way and cosmopolitan they don't travel to stay forever they always want to go back they always want to go back oh very patriotic Iceland is the best the food sorry matter that's the best food in the world I mean, yeah, sometimes it's out of, you know, out of logic. <laughs> like, of course it's nice, of course it's beautiful, of course the landscape and the nature are amazing. But there are limits then. 12 points go to Iceland. I'm sure there must be better to do in Iceland than watch Eurovision. <laughs> I remember one night in Reykjavik, we actually, we'd been drinking and um, we needed to go somewhere and someone said, let's just get in this car. And it was a car on the street with loud music playing. So we just got in the back of the car. They didn't know the drivers. And it were these two Icelandic guys who were drinking moonshine. And the, the, the kids that were in these cars were all dressed in Hawaiian shirts with their heaters on absolutely full, you know. You see, so you had this sort of improbable car going past, dressed with, filled up with, with Hawaiians, drinking Coca-Cola, you know, and the snow's falling and it's minus two, you know, phenomenal. And they were just sort of driving round and round, drinking moonshine. Wasn't a great way to travel because you just ended up in the same place, so we didn't stay long in that car. <laughs> Icelandic humour. There was Pauk Isolsen, the musician and organist, who was famous for his mimicry. And one of the forms his mimicry took was ringing people up, using the voice of someone else, and asking them round for a drink. It can be extremely really dry. surreal. Really yeah. dry. And it can also be extremely surreal. Sometimes you can yeah. get a little lost. And the person he did this to, of course, was somebody who was not likely to be sociable. And the person whose voice he used was someone who never had anyone in his house for a drink. When you first meet him, you think, are they just really kind of, not stupid, but really naive? And then when you get to know them, it's like, oh, I think they're playing games with my head. They're just actually, they've got this very strange, surreal 
sense of humour, which I, which I liked. It was quite sort of Monty Python esque. I think Monty Python has been a, a great influence on Icelandic culture. I mean, you can see it right back from the sagas. The sagas contain a lot of Monty Python uh, influence and uh, episodes in them, um, and I think it probably goes the way I mean goes right the way through Icelandic uh, culture. It's 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 a, a ma one of those magical things. <laughs> Well, I certainly don't really get Icelandic jokes in Icelandic, and sometimes when they're translated, they don't. But um, I, I, I think the sort of the bizarre side of, of the humour is really good. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to follow. Um, I once I read Haldor Laxness's um, Independent People the first time, and uh, oh, it was such a sad, sad book. And I rang Hilma and said, I've read it. It's, and he said, it's, fu it's so funny, isn't it? And I said, oh, <laughs> I thought it was terribly tragic. <laughs> so and then I, about a, few, a few months ago, I read it again. And it's a very funny book. <laughs> Útvarp Reykjavík, Útvarp Reykjavík, klukkan er sex. For people that are so hip, they look so hip, but then all of a sudden you have words coming out of their mouth that sounds like, I don't know. It sounds like, you know, people are attacking each other. I thought it was a joke. And I said, no, nah, you're not really talking, no, really talking between you in, in Iceland. I hate listening to Icelandic radio. It gives me a headache in, in minutes. You'll say, yeah. Uh, on the in on the inlet, yeah. It sounds like the language that uh, uh, would have been spoken in the Lord of the Rings. I think. Late atlir hemlr vau hem ah okay. We skill that again. All we're going to find is neither. Can't you borrow? When I hear the Icelandic language spoken, it sounds like the mountains to me. It's, it's sort of strong and hard and beautiful. Icelanders love to give speeches. Uh, they need almost no excuse to get up uh, with a glass of wine or liquor and give a speech. Um, which always has to be responded to by someone else, and the speeches can go on for some time. And as the evening wears on and people drink more and more, they become, at least to the Icelanders, more and more funny. I have to confess that I don't always understand what they're saying. Every, Ic every Icelandic man that I've met has a great story to tell. Guðs logum stendur hana, og... What seems in the books and the sagas that I've read uh, to be Icelandic is also what seems to be a characteristic of the Icelandic male in the bar, that they go on and on a bit. <laughs> so. And it's like all things, you know, stories grow and they grow out of proportion. What you end up getting in Reykjavik, which started in Huck, has no bearing on what, what really happened. I have the impression if you sneeze in Reykjavik, they say, God bless you in Akureyri. Maybe it's the little trolls running around with these little messages about everybody's personal and work life. And uh, yeah. Uh, there's something a little closed in about, about Icelandic writing, as there is about the country. You know, the sagas aren't short and to the point. I mean, they're rambling and repetitive and laxness. It's I mean, independent people rambles and repeats itself the whole time, and that's part of its charm, um, and part of its problem too. If, uh, but I, I don't, I think they're all wrapped up. But I would say that's a characteristic. You, you, no one's told you to shut up. And uh, you're home. Universe, from death until rebirth. You know the 